Uh, good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, the security issues uh, with these trigger action IoT platforms, and I'm going to show you uh, how to solve some of these problems. Okay, so say that you bought two new smart devices. You bought this uh, Google uh, Nest smoke detector, and you bought uh, an LG oven, and these are smart devices, so you can actuate them over the internet. And generally, this happens through a cloud service that is being run by the device manufacturer. So Google is going to run this uh, Google Nest service, and LG is going to run their own service. And as a user, you know, you're going to use some kind of client, like a smartphone app or a browser. You're going to uh, create an account on these cloud uh, services and then go and actuate these devices. But this is still in a silo, right? The whole Internet of Things is about creating these connections between devices so that you can gain uh, interesting automations. And so this is where the notion of a trigger action uh, platform uh, comes in. Uh, it basically breaks down these silos and enables interconnections between uh, these devices. So as before, a user, as a user, you'll create an account on a trigger action platform, um, and you'll do the additional step of connecting uh, these cloud services to your trigger action platform. And once you do that, the platform provides you as an end user, the ability to write your own simple trigger action rules of the form, if condition, then action. So here is one example. If smoke is detected, then turn off my LG oven. And this has broken down the silo, and really I, this, this, I feel, is, is a good definition of what the Internet of Things is supposed to be doing. Um, there are many such uh, platforms. There's a whole industry uh, surrounding these trigger action platforms. I've shown you a few examples here. And sort of the canonical example is known as if this, then that, or it's pronounced as ift. Uh, and to give you an idea of how popular this system is, uh, it has more than 500 IoT and non-IoT services that it works with, and it has uh, millions of users and millions of indi individually created trigger action uh, rules. So slightly more technically, uh, the way the trigger action platform interfaces with these uh, IoT services is through the OAuth protocol. Specifically, a large number of them use the OAuth 2.0 protocol. And so if you think of this at the scale of a service like IFT, um, platforms like IFT, these trigger action platforms, become veritable uh, gold mines of these OAuth bearer tokens. Um, and so then as security researchers, the natural question to ask is, uh, what if this web application, you know, the trigger action platform is just a web app, what if that web app is compromised? Um, and that is kind of the central question we are looking at in this work. And uh, sort of the answer may be obvious if the, if the, if the platform is compromised, uh, then the attackers can steal these OAuth bearer tokens and then invoke actions arbitrarily. So they can turn off the oven, they can turn it on, they can turn on a lawnmower, they can open your doors, they can do whatever they want, as long as you have connected this to the trigger action platform. So this is the first level of risk. The second level of risk is that even, even if these, uh, it's possible that these OAuth tokens uh, can be overprivileged, uh, as our experience with implementing uh, systems on top of uh, OAuth shows. And we actually did a study, uh, a, a brief case study of whether this actually happens in the context of IFT. Um, the details of this study are in the paper, but the, the high level uh, summary is that uh, we studied popular channels and we found that uh, the tokens that IFT has actually, um, um, they are overprivileged. And you may think, okay, is this overprivileged bad? Um, and, and it is. So like, I'll give you a few examples. So using stolen OAuth tokens that IFT is using, um, of, of the same scope that IFT is using, uh, we were able to re refer, reflash the firmware of a particle chip with the HTTP, single HTTP call. We were able to delete Google uh, files in Google Drive, and we were able to turn on and off devices arbitrarily. And the bottom line here is that these operations are not triggers and actions. So users cannot write rules with these operations. If does not offer that facility, and this is clearly overprivileged. So what is the upshot of all of this? The upshot is that really we have to begin to rethink our threat model, and I think a more appropriate threat model for these trigger action platforms is that they are untrusted. And in such a case, the core security guarantee is how can we guarantee that these actions are really executed as per user's intentions and their, their, their user rules? So we could try several things, right? So maybe we could try using short-lived uh, OAuth tokens. This is an interesting idea, but um, the problem is that it requires timely detection, and recent experience has shown us otherwise. We could try to do some kind of rule analytics or anomaly detection. This is good defense in depth, uh, but it does not uh, address the root cause of the problem. We could try to use a fully decentralized uh, architecture, so like every, every user will run their own little trigger action platform, and so then by this way you've 
you have removed the single valuable target, but then you don't gain the benefits of having uh, um, a, a sort of centralized cloud service. You don't get high availability, reliability, and all that good cloud stuff. Finally, you could try using finely grained tokens. Uh, this limits privilege, but you, know, you have usability issues. So our solution kind of takes inspiration from this notion of uh, decentralization and finely grained tokens, but it requires overcoming several uh, technical challenges. The first is that even though finely grained tokens limit privilege, uh, attackers can still misuse them in, in isolation. And, and so our solution to tackle this is to introduce a notion of uh, verifiable triggers and uh, rule-specific tokens. And basically, the, the guarantee at a high level is that if I give you, if you're a bearer of a token, uh, you can only invoke the action associated with that token if you can prove that the corresponding trigger actually happened within uh, some reasonable amount of time in the past. The second problem is that, okay, say we want to do this verification. Uh, we cannot do it on the trigger action platform itself because that is untrusted. We cannot uh, trust it to provide us a proof. Uh, our solution here is to modify the workflow in, in, in how a trigger action platform works. And specifically, we introduce this notion of a trusted client that users use to set up rules, uh, and we place the verification checks at the endpoints on the online services themselves. Uh, the third thing is, as I said before, usability will be a problem uh, with, uh, with finely grained tokens because unlike before, now uh, with, with a token for each recipe, the user would have to go through an OAuth uh, permission prompt every time they create a recipe, whereas earlier they just did it like a one-time operation whenever you connect the channels uh, to the platform. Uh, and we overcome this problem by introducing a, a new type of OAuth token known as a transfer token or an X token, uh, and that essentially allows an entity to uh, mint uh, a rule-specific token non-interactively, so this means without user interaction. And finally, uh, even if all the other conditions hold, uh, the attacker in the trigger action platform can still modify the data as it's passing through uh, the system. And really what we want uh, is, is our integrity guarantees, uh, and we do this using a signature scheme. So if you put these four properties together, it reels a principle that we call decentralized action integrity, and that's like the main message uh, of this paper, that you can architect trigger action platforms uh, to enforce this principle, and you will get strong integrity guarantees. So I'll show you a quick uh, before-after picture here to give you like a high-level sense of what's going on. So this is the, the trigger action platform designed today. Uh, you have this cloud service, users use a client, they uh, connect their channels, they program recipes, and then the service uses OAuth tokens uh, to execute these recipes with the devices. And as I said, uh, a lot of these high-powered bearer tokens uh, live in, in that centralized uh, system. Uh, it, and th the other picture shows you what uh, the decentralized uh, system is gonna look like. So as before, you have the cloud service, but now it's untrusted. Um, we designate the clients as trusted clients. So now the clients are kind of disconnected from uh, the trigger action platform. They are not implemented by the same entity. Think of things like, okay, the SSH server, the client and the protocol, they're not necessarily, the client and the server, they're not necessarily implemented by the same entity. These uh, trusted clients negotiate the OAuth tokens, recipe-specific tokens, rule-specific tokens, and the X tokens, um, uses program rules in there, and then all that is uploaded are the recipe descriptions and only the rule-specific tokens. Only the rule-specific tokens re uh, reside in the untrusted cloud. And recall that anyone who has a rule-specific token needs to provide uh, a proof that a trigger actually happened before they can actually use it. So let's jump into a little more detail and look at the protocol. So like I'm gonna walk you through creating a, a rule with our system, it's called Decentralized Trigger Action Platform, or DTAP. It's just an implementation of the decentralized action integrity principle. So we have four entities. We have the untrusted DTAP cloud. We have a trusted client. In this case, I'm just showing you an Android phone. Uh, we have the triggering service, which is the, uh, um, you know, for our example, is the smoke detector. Um, and we have the action service, which is the, the LG oven. And I want to program the rule if smoke is detected, uh, turn off the oven. So let's say that these are new devices. So the first thing is you've got to like onboard these devices into the system, or you've got to, in other words, you've got to do a channel connection step. Um, the trusted client on behalf of the user is going to uh, create an OAuth transaction uh, with the goal of negotiating an X token. So these are the high power tokens that let you exchange for recipe specific tokens. But the key point to keep in mind here 
is that these X tokens never leave that trusted client for that specific user. It never leaves that device. So this, at this point, this stage is done. Now say that we want to set up the triggering event, which is if there is smoke. So as before, the trusted client on behalf of the user is going to send out uh, a request to the triggering service saying that I want a token, uh, a trigger token, a recipe specific token uh, to be able to set up an alert whenever there's a carbon monoxide uh, event. And in response, it's going to get that trigger token, but it's going to also get uh, uh, the trigger, uh, uh, public key certificate belonging uh, to that trigger service. This public key certificate will be used for verification, and it only stays um, uh, right now with the trusted client, and only the rule-specific trigger token is forwarded to the untrusted DRAP cloud. So now we want to set up the, the action part of the rule, right? Turn off the oven. So as before, uh, the trusted client is going to uh, send out a request, and it's going to say, okay, I want an action token uh, to uh, turn off the oven. Here is my action X token. Uh, here are some parameters. In this case, there's none. Here is the name of the trigger. So like this is being tied to the smoke is detected trigger event, uh, a user ID for the current user, and the public key certificate of the triggering service that it got in the previous transaction. The action service is going to associate all of this information with a newly minted uh, bearer token called action token, and it's going to transmit that to the trusted client, which will then forward it to uh, the untrusted DTAP cloud. So at this point, the DTAP cloud has an, a trigger token, an action token, and the rule description. And so at this point, the rule is programmed and it's ready to run. So let's see what happens. So at runtime, uh, the DTAP cloud is going to set up a callback. This is so that whenever there is a smoke event, the triggering service is going to call back into, uh, into the untrusted DTAP cloud. Uh, and then it forwards. Uh, so whenever there's a smoke event, uh, there's going to be a trigger blob generated by the trigger service the untrusted DTAP cloud is simply going to forward that uh, and invoke the oven off action. And the trigger blob has everything we need to do a verification. So here is what it has. It has a time the, the trigger blob was minted, a time to live, a name of the trigger, some trigger data, and a UID. And all of this is signed using the private key uh, of the triggering service. So to verify this, um, first, I mean, of course, we have to ensure that the action token exists. This is happening on the action service. Then using the public key uh, uh, certificate that was sent to the action service earlier, uh, it's going to verify this, uh, this signature, and then it's going to do a bunch of sanity checks uh, on the blob itself. You know, so like, for example, verify that time moves forward, verify that there's no replay attack, verify that this is really the trigger that the user programmed. Finally, uh, it does two steps to verify that you know, it's really calling oven.off and any optional parameters. So at this point, what we have done is we have done an end-to-end -end, uh, verification of the rule uh, independently of the semantics of the rule itself. So all we are doing is checking time values and signatures. We don't depend on the semantics of the exact rule, but it, it kind of verifies that the rule executes correctly. We implemented this as a drop-in OAuth library. So like people who want to use the service simply replace a decorator in their Python code with ours, uh, and they get this function. Uh, in terms of our evaluation, uh, we, we use this rule, which is kind of representative because it has various conditions and transfer of data. Uh, the first thing we uh, evaluated was the transmission overhead, uh, and we find this to be minimal. I mean, our OAuth tokens are slightly larger, but not by much. It's around seven and a half kilobytes. Uh, we evaluated latency, verification latency, and although network uh, dominates most of it, uh, the verification latency is around 15 milliseconds. And practically, this translates to a very a small reduction in, in throughput. Uh, we did 10,000 trigger activations at a concurrency level of 2,000, based on our calculations of how the IF platform works. OK. So in summary, uh, these, cyber these emerging trigger action platforms stitch together various cyber physical services, but they pose a long-term large-scale threat if they are compromised. And what we have shown you here is the, the decentralized action integrity principle that uh, gives you strong integrity guarantees, and it is based on, on the notion of verifiable triggers and X tokens. And finally, this, uh, the, the performance uh, impact is, is quite minimal, so it's a practical system. Uh, finally, this represents a sort of a first step towards uh, a clean slate uh, redesign of, of IoT platforms, and a first step towards actually deprivileging the cloud as they are used in current IoT systems. 
Um, um, and this is kind of our vision for how these trigger action platforms uh, should work in the future. So thank you for your attention, and I'll uh, take questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, there are various levels to it. So uh, in specifically in terms of IFT, uh, this current architecture does not require changes on, on their system, but it does require changes on the online services. So like LG and Google and all these people would have to sort of buy into our notion of uh, OAuth tokens. So um, the cloud platform itself kind of can be reused. Um, but it requires uh, tie buy-in from the, the online services. Um, and that's not a large change, uh, depending on how you architect the software. Um, we built this uh, replacement library, and it's like literally a one-line change in, in, in the code. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty deployable. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, we do not. So the protocol does not run on the actual device. It's running on the cloud service that connects to the device. So all of the proofs and all of that is generated in the cloud service. So you wouldn't have that cost on the device itself. Now, that, that, I'm not saying that there may not be a design point where you run it on the device. There might be, but we haven't found uh, uh, the need to do it yet. Uh, so in the presentation, you showed like one uh, rule case. So what would be like if I want to chain multiple rules together? If you want to, sorry? If I want to chain multiple uh, rules together, uh, mm -hmm. how does the verification look like? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the model for most trigger action platforms is to have if trigger, then action. Um, the chaining can happen if uh, the user chains it, through, chains it through a physical device. And so then at that point, the verification just scales naturally. So you verify rule one, you verify rule two. That just happens naturally. There's no, no specific uh, additional steps we need to take. Hi, this is Soteri's UIUC. Uh, so during the protocol explanation, you said that we trust the client of the user. And let's assume that client is a smartphone. What's the level of trust that we have to have in that platform? Uh, do we, are we assuming to trust all applications that run on a smartphone, for example? Yeah, so um, we are assuming that the platform the trusted client is running on is not compromised. So like if it's like a smartphone, like Android or something, uh, it's not compromised. Uh, as in like the, the attacker does not have root access or cannot inspect the, the virtual memory of the trusted client uh, process because all of the high-powered tokens would live in that virtual memory. Um, so that's one level. Uh, our trusted client um, uses hardware-backed key stores whenever to encrypt the token at rest. Uh, so um, um, as long as the key store is functioning and used correctly, uh, that's another assumption right there. Thank you. Thank you.